Sorry. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Emily. I'm the marketing events coordinator at Meetup. And um, thank you for joining us for another Meetup Live event. Today, we are joined by special guest Mandy Neglich, advanced Cicerone, um, and author of How to Taste, as she demonstrates a tasting method designed to help you get the most out of what you're imbling. Learn to engage the five senses when you sniff, swirl, and sip your wine, even if it is non-alcoholic. If you're participating in this event, just have your drinks of choice nearby so you can sip on them. And before I hand it over to Mandy, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping slides. So um, today's event, the, um, it will be recorded, but you will not appear in the video. So don't worry, we can't see you. You can only see us. There's also a mute courtesy. Your audio will be muted throughout the event. So um, you, we can't hear you, but we, you can hear us as well. Um, questions, we want to hear from you. So please submit your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And we will have time at the end of the event to go through some of your questions. Closed captioning is also available to turn it on. Click on the live transcription icon at the bottom of your screen and select your preference. So for today's agenda, just doing a quick introduction right now for five minutes, and then I'll hand it over to Mandy for her tasting demo for 40 minutes, and then we'll come back at the end for a Q&A session for 15 minutes. So to introduce Mandy, thank you for being here. Mandy is an advanced Cicerone National Homebrew Competition Gold Medalist and writer. She covers food, travel, and beer for a variety of print and online publications, including Food and Wine, Vice, Taste of Home, and Vine Pear. Her new book, How to Taste, A Guide to Discovering Flavor and Savoring Life, uses her expertise as a certified taster, as well as reporting and interviews with more than 100 flavor scientists and professional tasters. Mandy's popular blog shares curiosities and information that makes drinks fun. And you can follow her at Mandy with, or drinks with Mandy. Um, and we will share those links as well in the chat at the end. So thank you so much, Mandy, for being here and I'll pass it off to you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to share the joys of tasting with everyone today. And um, thank you to Meetup for hosting Tasting with Everyone and Emily for that great intro. Uh, one question people often have for me when they hear my intro is, how can you be a certified taster? So I like to get that out of the way and it also kind of introduces the tasting method we'll go through today. Um, so I did go and get my uh, tasting certification through Aroxa, which is basically a program where we learn how to taste uh, 47 individual compounds uh, just blindly by smelling them. So a compound that smells like um, buttered popcorn is diacetyl. A compound that smells like rotten eggs is uh, H2S. So just memorizing all those compounds. And then we go through and we can work in things like QC, work in beverage consulting, and then also identify those compounds that we know as certified tasters in a variety of mediums, including delicious rosé, which we'll be tasting today. And I'm very excited to do that. Um, to come to write how to taste, as Emily mentioned, I talked to over 100 tasting professionals, whether they're out working in hospitality, they're actually making beverages, honey, cheese, olive oil, mustard, all kinds of mediums, or they're working in science, studying our senses. I took all of that research and my personal experience as a certified taster and made the seven step tasting method, which we're going to go through today. I will show you on my slides, all seven of the steps use S's in the name because I thought that was a fun little way to make them a little bit more memorable, um, which we're going to look at now. So the first step is setting. Wherever you guys are, the fun thing about this tasting is we're all going to be in different settings. So we are right now taking in the sights, the smells, the scents around us and of our setting. So one thing you might not know is it's not just the color in your glass, we all have our rosés here, that you you're affected by. It's also the color of the room. For example, ice cream scoop shops tend to be painted pink as a color because pink is an indicator of sweetness. So when you're in the ice cream shop tasting your ice cream, you're getting a little bit of a boost of sweetness just from the pink walls around you. 
some interesting color research that they've done also is that green makes coffee taste a little deeper, a little more complex. And it's no surprise that a lot of the, the really big coffee chains use green in their logos for that reason. So if you're in a green room right now, my room is a little bit tan. I don't think it's going to affect uh, my tasting too much. But say you're in a room that's red or pink, you might notice your wines are a little sweeter today than they would in another room. Um, another thing you're going to notice, we're going to try to go for um, rooms that are quiet because our taste signals actually travel from our tongue on a nerve called the corda tympani through our inner ear and then to our brain where they translate taste. And anything that's jostling that inner ear while you're tasting is also jostling those taste signals. So imagine a very loud, powerful hip hop song in the background, you know, a big bass line. That's going to dull those taste sensations a little bit because they're really getting jostled as they're going through your ear. Fun research has happened that shows that jazz music makes wine taste a little bit better. It must be something about those smooth tones jostling those taste messages as they're going to our brain. So in the book, you'll find an outline of all of the ways that your setting can affect you. But today, we'll just look around our room. You know, we're all tasting together all around the world. It was great to hear where you guys are coming from. And you can just think about how your setting might be affecting what you're tasting today. Our next step is the C step. So step one was setting. Step two is C. So I'm going to compare my French rosé, which is Whispering Angel, and my Spanish rosé, which is Borsau. So I have Whispering Angel and Borsau. If you have for all four of the wines in front of you, make sure your French rosé and your Spanish or Italian rosé are next to each other. Because in this step, we're going to take in how the colors compare to each other. It's really helpful in doing any kind of tasting method to compare two things to each other because it helps you pick up the nuances for the next time you're tasting. So here I have my French rosé and my Spanish rosé, the Borsal. And what we're looking at with the colors, it's a little bit harder to tell in the glass than it is in these bottles behind me. But French rosés tend to be lighter in color, while Italian and Spanish rosés tend to be a little bit deeper and darker in color. Some Italian rosés almost look like they're just very light red wines. We're not going to look too much into what the, the color is as far as flavor. We're just going to kind of appreciate it. One thing about my tasting method that I think is really important and I expressed in the book is all of these winemakers are artisans of whatever you eat, cheese, chocolate, um, the beautiful dinners you have out at restaurants or even at home. The artisans and craft makers put so much effort into making them appear the way that they do. So we're just going to take a second in the C step to appreciate what we're seeing in front of us. If we were professional tasters, we might be looking for flaws. So for example, in a rosé, typical rosés, you don't want them to be too cloudy. Um, you want them to have that brilliance. You can see how this is casting the light forward, looking really beautiful. So that um, is some things you might be looking for as a professional. But as people enjoying wine, we're just going to take in the comparison of the color. Um, you guys can see for yourself which one is darker. For the most part, if you have a rosé from Provence, it's always going to be that light, beautiful salmon while something from Spain or Italy is gonna be a little darker, maybe that deep copper salmon all the way to a raspberry color or a blush. So that's our setting step, step one, step two, our C step. And now we're going to get to the sniff step, which is the longest um, step in any tasting method, whether professional or just you know at the winery or just tasting at home. It should be the longest step because about 80% of what we consider flavor is coming from our aroma receptors. So we have our, our gustatory receptors, our taste receptors are on our tongue and throughout our, th our throats and body. And then our olfactory receptors are all in a bulb right about here behind our eye. And that is what's giving us all of the aroma, all of the flavor that we're really enjoying and things like wine. So our taste receptors can sense our five basic tastes. We're getting sweetness, saltiness, bitterness, umami, and sourness. So taking a sip of rosé, if you could only taste it, you had no olfactory receptors, it would taste maybe a little bit sour, tiny bit bitter, depending on the rosé, and a little bit of sweetness. Whereas all of the color and you know interesting notes of tasting are going to come from aroma. So anything floral, berry, all of those things are going to be colored in by your aroma receptors, not your taste buds. So we're going to take time to appreciate that, sip, or that sniff step through a couple different sniffs. So Let's grab our French rosé first. And what we're gonna do just to start out is a distant sniff. So everyone just kind of try about six inches from your nose, see if you notice anything. You can swirl your wine a little bit to try to kick some of that aroma out. I'm not smelling a lot on this Whispering Angel. It's a pretty subtle wine. So what we're gonna do is move to our next step, which is the moving sniff. So we're gonna move it below our nose, keep it moving. 
and then take it away and see if we thought we smelled anything. The reason we're doing this so slowly is because our senses are actually there to be difference detectors. What we're looking for is changes in our environment and our sensory acuity of our nose and our palate to pick that up and make sure we're staying safe. For example, way back when we were all living out on the plains together trying to find shelter and surviving, you wanted to be extremely sensitive to the scents around you because you could smell something like the scent of the sweat of a predator or smoke in the air. Back when we were living like that, you know, you smelled smoke in the air, there was no fire truck coming to save you. You had to start running as fast as you could sense that smoke. So the reason that we have to go very slow introducing this aroma to ourselves is because we'll quickly go blind to any really strong scents. For example, when you see those stock photos of people, you know, tasting wine and their nose all the way down in here, if you were sucking down that aroma like that, you're gonna go blind to the strongest scents in your wine. So if your really big top note was something like strawberry, which I'm thinking of because I'm smelling it on this whispering angel. If I dove my nose in there and just was smelling it, smelling it, smelling it, pretty quickly I would lose that strawberry aroma and I would think the wine smelled more floral or like something else. So in order to really get all the notes of the wine, we're gonna really slowly introduce ourselves to that aroma. So after doing that distant sniff, about six inches, and then our moving sniff, you're gonna, if you were taking notes, you would take down what you're smelling. Like I said on this, I'm getting a lot of that kind of watermelon rind and strawberry, really fresh smells to me, a little bit of that grassiness that I think is really signature to a Provence Rosé. Now we're gonna get to really dive our nose in there a little bit. This is going to be our short sniff. And after speaking to scientists who work in sensory, I did find that this is considered the scientific best way to get aroma into your nose, short explosive sniffs. So we're gonna do three one second sniffs together. We're gonna go one, two, three, <laughs> like that. And that's basically, we wanna do those little explosions of aroma because we're trying to get those chemical compounds from the, the wine up to our olfactory bulb where we can process them as flavor. You also don't want to dry out your nasal cavity because a it's really important that that olfactory bulb has a little layer of moisture on it because that's what those olfactory, those aroma compounds are going to bond to and then allow your brain to detect them. So if you dry your nose out too much by doing really deep, really long sniffs, you're not going to be as sensitive to flavor anymore. And the whole point of tasting is staying sensitive to that flavor. So we just did our distant sniff our moving sniff, and then our short sniff. And now we do get to do that really beautiful long sniff. We're just gonna do three seconds and then pull it away again. So one, two, three, and then away. So you should now, you've slowly introduced yourself to the aroma of that French wine. And now we're gonna switch over to our Spanish or Italian wine, whichever you have. Um, we'll just quickly go through those steps again. Our distant sniff, I like to swirl it a little on the distant sniff so you guys can swirl with me. Then our moving one, and this one I'm definitely picking up, I feel like more stone fruit and like cherries, a little of those deeper red fruits, not so light and bright on that uh, as at Provence. We'll do our short sniff. One, two, three, then away. And then you're gonna take a little bit of a longer sniff. One, two, three seconds. And I'm also picking up some spice character on this that I actually didn't get at all on my French rosé. I hope you guys are starting to notice the difference. And as I said before, our noses are those difference detectors, right? So they're really great if you smell something in this French rosé and then go back and smell the Spanish next to it. You might notice those aromas change. Like I feel like this got a lot, a lot more of that like floral spice to it after smelling the French. So going back and forth is also a good method to get to know your wines. Um, now we're gonna do something that requires a little bit of choreography. Uh, it's called the retro nasal sniff. So I just told you so much about how to get no, um, aroma up that nose, which is our ortho, nas our ortho nasal passage. Now we're going to use the other path to that bulb that's beside, behind our eyes. It's called the retro nasal passage. It's going up the back of your throat. Um, so basically this is like, you can think of it as smelling with the back of your nose. And when I explain it to people in tasting classes and the way we think about it as professionals is thinking about playing a piano. You're playing your scales up the piano over and over again. Then all of a sudden you decide to play the scales the opposite way. Even though it's the exact same notes, just in the reverse order, it has kind of a different feeling to it. You know, you get a different tone when the scale is going down than when it was going up. So we're just thinking, about playing the notes of our olfactory receptors backwards. And this really does change how you're perceiving the flavor. So let's grab our Spanish wine this time. We'll start with that one. And we're going to do this together. 
first I'll explain for you how to do it and then I'll do it with you. So the first and most important thing when tasting retro nasally is to close that ortho nasal passageway. So we're going to have to pinch our noses shut. Then you'll take a little breath because it's really important to have oxygen and with your nose shut, the only way to do it is that we'll take a medium sized sip of the wine, swish it over your palate, try to get all the air your cheeks, the top of your palate, the under your tongue, everything. And as you swallow, you're going to keep your mouth closed and exhale out of your nose. This is going to force all of those aromas that were in your mouth up the back of your throat into that olfactory bowl where we can perceive them as flavor. So if you're ready, let's get together and do this choreography. Like I said, spread out all over the world. So we're going to pinch our noses shut. We're going to take a medium sip of the wine, swish around your palate, then swallow and exhale out your nose. Should really have to push it out. So let's try it again. I'll talk you through it. We're going to pinch our nose, take a sip, swish over your palate, and then as you swallow, keep those lips shut and exhale out the nose. I'm just gonna taste it a little bit with you. Now we're finally getting some flavor of the wine, you know, 10 or 20 minutes into our presentation. But that, you should really feel a sensation of flavor filling your mouth when you take that step. That's because the last thing your brain saw was wine going into your mouth. And even though you're getting all of that flavor from your nose, it's still misplacing those signals and putting them in your mouth. So our taste buds get a little bit too much credit. It's really our noses that need to get all of the credit for tasting. Now let's try the olfactor or the retronasal sniff on our French wine, compare what we're getting. So we're gonna punch our nose, take a medium sized sip, swish it over your palate, and then exhale out your nose as you swallow. I'm gonna do it really quick with you. So pinching, take a breath. If you guys are tasting the Whispering Angel like I am, I really am getting those watermelon forward flavors and that really crisp watermelon, you know, that pale color of the watermelon almost right next to the rind, which is so different than that little bit of deeper red fruit, stone fruit that you're getting off the Spanish wine for me. So that's your retronasal sniff. Finally, we get to get to the sample step after so much sniffing, um, we get to take a sip of our wine. So anytime you're drinking alcohol, the first little sip we take, while we're, whether we're professionally tasting or just enjoying it, is just acclimating your palate to having some alcohol in it. So we can just go all take a short sip. Just to get your palate, you know, wet and ready for some wine. Um, then we're going to go into our different kinds of tastes. So the first step is the match taste. Like I said, so much of flavor is aroma. And the first time we take a sip, we just wanna think if the aroma matches the flavor. And you might think, oh, obviously it will. Um, but there's a lot of chemicals and a lot of um, flavors that are really typical that don't actually have aromas. For example, quinine and caffeine are both very bitter. They don't have any aroma. So you wouldn't be able to smell bitterness on them. You would just taste it. Same with same thing with sucrose, which is white sugar. It actually doesn't have any aroma. You wouldn't be able to sense it at all until you tasted it on your palate. And citric acid is also the same. It's not going to have a sense, but it has obviously a big punch of sourness that you might not expect if you couldn't smell it in the aroma. So we'll just do a little taste here and see if we think the aroma matches our wine flavor. And something in the French rosé, which is very, um, signature to the Provence style of French rosé is there's a little bit of salinity there that I don't think you would necessarily expect from that aroma. You know, I was saying things like flowers, watermelon, strawberries, then you get a little bit of that salinity. So that's a little bit of a, it still matches, it's still in line with everything, but something new that you're getting from your first flavor. For our second step, it is our second taste, it's going to be the mouthfeel taste. So we're going to go ahead over to our Spanish rosé and try that for the mouthfeel taste. All you're gonna do a little bit different here is take the, mat, the uh, wine on your palate, hold it for about three seconds and then swallow. And just think about how that made your mouth feel. If it changed it at all, is there a feeling that's leaving or lingering on your palate? And the reason we call this a mouth feel step is because it's not texture, it's not consistency. It is actually your mouth feeling the wine or whatever you're tasting. We have such sensitive palates, we can actually sense a grit with our teeth that's a tenth of the size of a grain of sand. So you're talking super tiny, something you could not see with your bare eye. Also something as thin as a seventh of the size of the width of the human hair. So whichever visualization works better for you to really show 
how sensitive our palates are to things like weightiness and grit. So we just did the mouthfeel sip on our Spanish uh, rosé. Now let's see if we feel any difference feeling it with our mouth on the French rosé. So three seconds and then a swallow. And you should notice a little bit of a difference in this, what we call in wine body. It's a little bit heavier on the palate in your Spanish or Italian rosé than your French rosé. That just has to do with the kinds of grapes, where they're grown, how they're produced. But there's a little bit of a weightiness to that Italian or Spanish um, wine that isn't quite there. It's a little bit lighter. And like I said, a little more acidic in that French rosé. Um, and again, that's mouth feel because you wouldn't say these look different, right? If you swirl them next to each other, I'm looking down at them. They swirl, they look pretty much like the consistency of water, a little bit lighter. But on that mouth feel, when your palate is feeling your wine, it is a big difference. So those are the things that we take time when we're tasting just to stop and think about a little bit. So, so far in these wines, we're thinking one is a little bit of those lighter, brighter fruits, maybe strawberries, watermelons, things like that. As we're tasting, you can also use something like a flavor wheel here to help you pick out some of the flavors. For example, we just talked about strawberry and watermelon. Now let's think about our Spanish um, wine. You can use a tool like this. This is a flavor wheel from Wine Folly, but you can find flavor wheels all over the internet and all kinds of books for any medium from cheese to olive oil to honey even. Um, everything has these flavor wheels and it really helps you just prompt your mind. If you're having a hard time, sometimes you go to a wine tasting and someone asks, oh, what does the wine taste like? And it's hard to pull out your first note. It's a little intimidating and to put forward, I taste strawberry in this. So a, a tasting wheel can be a really nice way just to give yourself a couple prompts. You know, let's smell this Spanish or Italian rosé together and give it a little sip, maybe a mouthfeel sip. And think, okay, do I get any raisin, fig, date, these dark, these darker um, notes on the tasting wheel? I don't get any of those. Uh, to me, that fig is a little heavy, a little sticky. So maybe let's go to the next section. Bubble gum, maybe a little bit is in there. Going to a different section, we see things like black cherry. This is feeling a little bit more correct to me. Even maybe a little bit of black currant. That fruit punch raspberry definitely feels more in line with what I'm tasting. Um, and you can, no matter what wine you're tasting, you'll be able to find flavor notes on these kind of tasting wheels. So they're a great, great way to prompt if you're gonna taste in a group, prompt yourself and look, wh what notes am I tasting? What am I not tasting? And you can kind of go through it even like a checklist if you wanted to and say, yes, this is there, no, it's not, or search for it if you wanna look for it. Um, so that's a great way to just prompt yourself in a tasting and not be so intimidating. Uh, again, we're on our third out of our three ways to sample the wine on our sip slash sample step. And so this is going to be our aftertaste taste. And this is something, an aspect of flavor that people just don't give a lot of thought to, but does make a big difference, especially when you're doing something like pairing wines with food. So your aftertaste can last anywhere from one second to as long as 60 seconds with certain drinks. So what's going to happen is when you swallow your wine, you're, we're just gonna sit there and think about it for a second and see how long the aftertaste hangs around. And the reason this is important with, when pairing with food is often the aftertaste of your drink is still in your mouth when you're going in for your next bite. So if you have a wine that ends up quite tannic and bitter, that is going to affect the way that your food tastes when you take a bite afterwards. And same thing with a wine that ends really sweet and maybe cloying on the palate, a little heavy on the palate, that's gonna change what you're tasting in your next bite. So to do an aftertaste taste, all we're gonna do is take a sip and then as you swallow, just exhale out over your palate. It helps kind of kick off that aftertaste a little bit faster. So I'm gonna do this with my French wine first. Just blow out a little bit as you're swallowing. And think about how it's affecting your tongue. You'll hear things like a tannic wine or it's, it has a drying mouth feel. And what's actually happening there is your tongue and your palate are literally being dried by compounds called polyphenols that are in wines that bond with your saliva and literally lift it off of your palate, effectively drying it. So when you say you're getting a drying sensation, it's not just something you're thinking, you're literally feeling your palate dry out. Something else that can happen during the aftertaste is if you're noticing acidity of the wine, which I definitely am in both of these wines, you'll start to notice a little bit of a pooling of saliva coming from the back of your mouth. And that's there as our natural pH buffer. Basically, 
acidity is tr telling your body that there's a thing that could burn your throat, it could burn your stomach here, we gotta buffer that solution before it goes into our system. And so that's why you're feeling that. Some professional wine tasters will actually tip forward a little bit to feel how much of that natural buffling, buffering solution saliva is coming, is being produced, and that's how they can judge the acidity of the wine. So a little fun, if you wanna be a real pro wine tasting uh, tip for you, is just trying to tip forward and seeing are you feeling that um, production at all? And that's coming from your acidity of your wine. So we have our two wines. I would say I'm feeling a lot more acidity on this French Rosé. I'm also thinking neither of them are too tannic, but they have a little bit of drying in that aftertaste. And it's a moderate aftertaste. It definitely hangs around on your palate for a little bit. But the reason Rosés are great to pair with food is because they're not too intense in um, many aspects. So it doesn't have a super long aftertaste. It doesn't have a very intense flavor for the most part. So that's our aftertaste sip. And now we're going to, <laughs> in this wine tasting, we're at home. I don't think we have to worry too much about the decision to swallow or spit, but it's something I always include in a tasting method because it's really important if you're going to go to say a great wine festival where, where you'll taste seven or eight or nine different wines, you want to feel comfortable spitting. You don't want to take in all of that alcohol. You just want to appreciate the flavor because that's also showing respect to that 10th wine maker that you're tasting their wine, that you're trying to get the most out of all of the flavors and not a kind of a little loopy and losing your sensory acu acuity by the time you get there. So in the book, I outline how to really spit gracefully and you would be amazed at some of these psalms that go to these huge tasting events. They can hit a spit bucket from across the room and look very beautiful. So it's something to think about if we were in a different wine setting. But here at home, we were tasting together. I don't think we have to worry about spitting too much. So we've compared these two quite a bit. Um, we're thinking about the different uh, tasting notes in them. You know, like I said, uh, it's quite a high acidity. Italian wine is very typical. Um, Spanish, not quite so much. Like I said, a, Pro a Provence Rosé is always going to have a little acidity there. A little of that salinity is quite signature. But now it's time, I have the Chandon. I waited to open it so we could all enjoy the pop together. But anyone who has their sparkling rosé, now is the time to go ahead and pop that open. Before we get to our seventh step, which is sit and synthesize, we're gonna add this into the mix. So always make sure when you're opening a sparkling rosé, just keep that cork, or sparkling anything, I should say, away from your face or anyone else's. <laughs> Hope that pop wasn't too loud for you guys. We're just gonna pour a little sample of this. Very important. It's a really beautiful, this Chandon is a really beautiful color. And we'll just quickly, now that we've gone through all the steps, this is a great time to review a little bit of what we learned. Let's go through them again together. So our C step, obviously this is quite a bit darker for me than an, either the French or the Spanish Rosé. This is coming from California. Um, obviously in this one, we have a new element to look at too, which is our bubbles. Then we are going to go ahead and get to sniffing. So distant sniff, something to know about carbonated beverages is that they're always gonna have a little bit more going on in the distant sniff because those bubbles are literally acting like little cars or boats, whatever you wanna think of, carrying the cargo flavor up out of the glass into your nose. So always a little more scent going on here. Then we're gonna do our moving sniff again, slowly introducing ourselves to that aroma. If anyone's getting notes now, this one is a lot more juicy to me than my last one. It almost has a little cotton candy kind of thing going on, like a little sponge sugar situation. Um, with that fruitiness, that's pretty typical. That's just moving. Now we're gonna do our scientifically best sniffs, which is our three, our three one second sniffs. So we're gonna go one, two, three. Really start getting that. This one has a lot, yeah, of like a more nectarine apple or a more nectarine maybe a apricot going on for me. Love to know what, how your guys' are comparing. And if you want to, go ahead and go back. This is the best way to learn about what you like and learn how to taste wine is comparing them. So smelling, you know, this is coming across, this Spanish is way more floral to me now. And now we have the sparkling, which again is getting more of those jammy notes almost. Really interesting. And we can now do our retro nasal sniff. I hope you guys remember the choreography, but I'll talk you through it. We're going to pinch our nose, take a, a little breath, take a medium-sized sip, Swish it over your palate and then swallow and exhale out your nose all at once. So I'll do that with you. Pinch, breath. Exhaling out the nose. 
wow. And that sensation, that was a very strong retronasal sensation for me. I could feel the um, flavor just like filling my mouth. And like I said, I'm getting a lot of really juicy jammy notes on this, which I, I kind of wasn't expecting. Some cherry happening here. My rosé is also a little bit warmer. So getting some of those bolder flavors out. When our beverages are very cold, they're going to hold on to their flavor. Think about those aroma compounds having a very low energy when they're cold, right? So they're not moving a lot. They're kind of just sitting in place, maybe shaking. You can envision them. When you add heat, when things get a little bit warmer, they start to move a lot faster and they're much easier to get up that nose to your olfactory bulb and sense their flavor. So it's kind of, people describe things opening up as they warm. It's literally those flavor compounds opening up, making more space for themselves and flying out of that, um, flying out of that glass so you can perceive them as flavor. Another fun thing we're gonna do is um, our swirl sniff at this step. So you can use any of your wines, it doesn't have to be the sparkling wine. I'm actually gonna go ahead and do my Spanish wine. I call this the last kiss of flavor because what we're really gonna do is go ahead and swirl all the remaining flavor out of our wine and use it as our last little sip. So I try to wait till the end of after I've enjoyed my glass of wine when I just have a few sips left because what we're gonna do is really knock all of that flavor out. So you're gonna take your hand, you're gonna create a seal over the top of your wine, and then you're gonna start swirling it. You can swirl while I talk. We're gonna swirl for three to five seconds. But what's happening is in that headspace of this wine here, all of the flavor compounds are gathering. So we're swirling, you're gathering all of this these flavor compounds. So you're gonna get a really intense puff of flavor when we take our hand off. So before we do that, you're going to line your hand up with your nose, and then all together across the world, we're take it off when I say go. So ready and go and deep sniff. And you'll notice that the um, intensity of that sniff is going to be just so much more intense than any of the previous ones because all of that aroma was gathering in the top of the glass. But the reason we wait till the end of our glass of wine to do that is because if you're drinking something, especially something carbonated or something with very subtle flavors, you'll really swirl all of the flavor out of your wine. And the last couple sips are going to be not quite as exciting as they were before. So back to our sparkling wine. We're just gonna get our mouthfeel sip again. It's gonna be a little different this time because we have that new um, element of carbonation. So when you're doing a mouthfeel sip with carbonation, we can think about carbonation on a spectrum from very, very fine bubbles, we might call them a mineral water bubble, to very what we call rough soda pop bubbles. The, that's all just going to depend on the type of wine, the minerals that are in it, what kind of grapes were used. But it's a really nice spectrum when you start to taste your wines next to each other. I actually really enjoy a bigger, rougher soda pop bubble, which this has. Um, so that's a really fun thing to, to notice if you like and start to think about what you want to order in your wine. So you want something that's a little bit more of that rough bubble or something that's really fine and that subtle sparkle. Again, that now feels going to be completely different than the first two. Then we can do our aftertaste taste and really think about what your sparkling wine is bringing to the table that the other two maybe didn't. So like I said, for me, this one is definitely the most um, big flavor forward of the three wines that I've tasted so far. Um, and in our last seconds here, if we have, if anyone has a non-alcoholic wine or I suggested tea as an alternate, if you're doing a, a wine tasting and want to add something else to your mix, because we don't always have to try to think if we're going for something non-alcoholic, you don't always have to try to recreate those alcoholic flavors in your non-alcoholic option. I think tea, especially doing something like rosé, is a really great way to get something that's complex. It's still natural, just like all the wines are made naturally, but it has a lot of different notes. So I have a hibiscus tea here. I'm gonna take a quick taste of it. First smelling, of course. Um, And that's a good tip too. You don't always have to plug your nose if you don't want to. If you're in public and you don't feel like you want to do that really quick, you can just try not to smell out of it and then take a quick swish and exhale out of your nose as you swallow. Um, but hibiscus has this natural sourness that I thought really mirrored the acidity of rosés. It also has those floral notes that we look for in a lot of rosés, especially I was getting today out of my Spanish one. Um, and it has that natural complexity. So there's still the depth, there's still the tannins in your aftertaste. It's a really enjoyable way to give someone an option that's still complex and interesting without necessarily getting a one-to-one non-alcoholic 
rosé wine. However, if any of you have those non-alcoholic brands that I suggested, it's also very fun to go through that full tasting method side by side with something like a French wine rosé and a non-alcoholic rosé and see where you notice those differences especially something like the mouthfeel sip that I told you guys about, you might not notice that warming of alcohol. So non-alcoholic option for me today, I'm going with this hibiscus tea that has those floral notes, that little bit of natural sourness, and some tropical notes that I really think near rosé without exactly replicating it. And our final step in our last couple minutes are sit and synthesize, which are the reason I wrote this book. I really think we don't take enough time in our lives to pay attention to aroma and flavor, like we did today, we don't have to put so much pressure on everything you're tasting, every individual tasting note. It can just be what's coming up, what am I enjoying, and taking those creating memories. So let's all take a minute today and think about what was our favorite rosé that we tried. Maybe think about that flavor wheel, which was your favorite tasting note on it, how we're tasting all together all around the world, and just take that in and create a sensory memory that the next time you have one of these rosés, you'll go out and think about. I was really um, impressed today with this Borsal, the uh, Spanish wine. I thought it was really unexpected to me, maybe just in this exact setting, but I'm definitely gonna keep my eye out for it and try it again in a different setting and see if I still get those cherry flavors with that delicate acidity that I was really looking for. Um, you guys can sit and synthesize however you'd like, thinking about your setting, thinking about that flavor on your palate, feel that feeling, the mouth feel sip, all of that comes together to create a memory that then the next time you go wine tasting, you might be able to more quickly pick out some of these notes, some of those strawberries we found in the Provence or French rosé, some of those cherries and violet flavors that we, or white flower flavors we found in our Spanish rosé. And then of course those big American soda pop rough bubbles we had in our sparkling or whatever sparkling you were trying, those are gonna come back much easier to you the next time you taste rosé because we took such a great time here to focus on our flavors that were coming through and sit and synthesize all together. And again, if you're looking for a non-alcoholic option, that's always great to offer people, but we don't have to think so narrowly as it has to be a non-alcoholic wine. Thinking of things like teas and artisanal sodas are also a great option if you're looking to serve people non-alcoholic options during your wine tasting. And I think we're about ready to get into some questions here, um, but I can also, yeah. <laughs> oh, ready. Thank you for doing that. That was awesome. I'm gonna watch the recording after and do this on my own. <laughs> oh, that's a great point. Yeah, you can use anything you wanna taste with this recording. So come back to it with your beer, your tea, anything you want. Um, that's a great point. I'm gonna do it with wine. I I'm a newbie with wine and I wanna get more into it and actually figure out what I like. So <laughs> I need to do it. Um, but yeah, that uh, if anyone wants to go back and watch, we will have a recap and recording on our blog um, at meetup.com slash blog, which will be up in a few days. Um, so we're just going to hop right into Q&A. We got a lot of questions. So um, we'll start with Renee. Uh, they asked, should rosé be refrigerated? That's a great question. So definitely it should be stored in the refrigerator. It's something you're gonna enjoy that crispness that I was talking about, that little bit of acidity is gonna be really nice when it's chilled down. But as I was talking about how you can get a little bit more flavor when things warm up, it's really nice to just sit your rosé on the counter for 10 minutes before you pour it to let it, those flavors start to open up. You don't want it super, super cold. Like I said, it'll be holding on to all those flavors and you won't get to enjoy them as much. So sitting it out 10, 15 minutes before you pour it is the perfect amount. Good to know. Um, Anonymous asked, they said, so I had a 2015 cheap California rosé in my fridge. It smells like a jar of green olives to me. I suppose it's gone bad. Um, sorry, it moved. Um, to be <laughs> fair, I don't like much beyond a bowl Interesting. Um, so some of those olive flavors are totally natural in wines, especially California is not as classic. There's not as many rules as something like Provence where they all taste the same. So that brininess, that salinity I was talking about mixed with certain wine compounds can definitely come through as an olive flavor. Um, I doubt it's bad unless, especially if it was sitting in your fridge, I doubt it's gone bad. Uh, that keeps things in check and winemakers are so great, especially in California about making sure there's no little bugs or anything that's going to make your wine go bad. Um, in there. So I think might just be a really different kind of rosé, a uh, different flavor that they were going for. And uh, maybe an interesting one. It could be fun to pair with uh, food hearing that. So. Thank you. Um, another anonymous. Um, 
Very similar question. Um, they have um, Italian rosé, which is lighter than the French one they have. Does that mean the Italian one is not good anymore? Um, the Italian one smells more low key and it has more of a spice smell than a floral. Interesting. Yeah. And spice is definitely something you can pick up from Italian wines. So the color is a, really an indication of the way that they make the wine. It doesn't have to do a ton with quality. They can make um, rosés by macerating them, by pressing them a lot of different ways. So I definitely wouldn't say the light color is an indication of anything going off. And I, I was in that C step that we do, the second step, we don't really want to look too much into color as long as it still looks appetizing and beautiful to us. Um, it doesn't tell you that many hints. There's a lot of shortcuts that some wineries can take by adding color to things. Um, you know, you hear these like uh, saying about like the legs on wine, you know, when you swirl it and you see it run down. But we don't really talk about that too much anymore because things like adding alcohol or adding sweetness can really affect those. So it's not really an indicator of the quality or the um, alcohol level of wine like we used to think it was. Mm -hmm. So how do you tell if your wine has gone bad? Just that, that's a great question. Um, so a lot of times when a wine has gone bad, it's uh, something that we call corked. And that is coming, like I said, winemakers are usually very good at keeping any little bugs or anything that will let your wine go bad out of the wine process. But corks are natural. Um, they have a compound called TCA that will infect your wine. So if you ever smell a mustiness, I always say it's like really like a basement or like a closet that might have you know, something wet in it that's been sitting in there for a while, M that mushroomy, real mustiness, um, that's usually an indicator that something is what we call corked. Uh, the other option is sometimes every now and then you'll get a wild yeast in there called Britannomyces, and that's going to make your wine smell like a barnyard and uh, specifically kind of what you're shoveling off the barnyard. <laughs> so if you ever get that, if you're ever really smelling farmy, special farm animals, very strong, uh, that's an indicator. But then there's wines like Bordeaux that have a little of that barnyard to them and it's actually just a really nice way to round out the complexity of the wine that little we sometimes call it sweaty horse blanket um, so if you you know just that little bit of um funkiness to it is a nice way to round out a Bordeaux so it's only when those scents that I'm talking about are really overpowering um that your wine's probably gone bad <laughs> doesn't happen too often <laughs> good to know so the wine that you guys probably have is not bad yet hopefully <laughs> yeah and we're all different in what we taste too so it could definitely be bad to you right like if you're very sensitive to something even people are su super sensitive to a compound called beta ionone that smells like violets and they can say oh this is like way too floral I can't bear to drink it you know and so if it's bad to you pass the wine on but it's probably not bad for everyone <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see, we got a question from Gail. They asked, is heating flesh cooling felt in the mouth during exhale or throat? Can you feel it in the, is it supposed to be felt in the mouth or the throat when you exhale? That's a great question. So it will definitely change with whatever you're tasting. So something like tequila, you'll feel that warmth go all the way down into your chest. Something like rosé, which tends to be a lower alcohol wine, you're going to, you're, it's not going to go too far past your mouth, um, past like kind of the very beginning of the back of your throat. But every now and then, if you get like a really, you know, 14, 15% wine, you might start to feel like go down your throat. And that's just that alcohol warming sensation. Um, it's kind of fun, you know, if you wanted to try a beer, a wine, and a little bit of whiskey or something next to each other and feel where that warming ends up for you, that's a good way to learn how to gauge alcohol when you're tasting something. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, a quick question from Deb, they asked, what are the three names of the wine that you had? Yeah, so I have, um, I put them up on my slides. You should be able to see them in the replay too, but this is the Whispering Angel. It's from Provence. Um, this is Borsao. It's from uh, Northern Spain. It's yeah, our Spanish wine. And then I was drinking the Chandon from California. So it's just a California Brut. Um, there we go. Uh, brut Rosé. So a little bit, it should be a little bit drier, but I was, like I said, I that was a fun one to open. because I was like, whoa, big juicy flavor is happening today. So um, definitely those are my three. And then this is a hibiscus tea. I put them in the um, 
the notes, but pretty much any hibiscus tea would be great. They all have that natural floral and that natural acidity that kind of mirrors what you're getting in a rosé. Nice. Yeah, as Mandy said, um, the, the recap will have all of this information and um, the event page has the list of alcohols or wines too that she was sipping on today. Mm -hmm. um, Jane asked, which wines are helped by aerating? I thought only reds, but a friend was aerating Pinot Grigio recently and I wondered if I missed it, something. It's a really interesting question. So aerating is, um, it's kind of to each their own. So we actually say, and I talk about in the book as flavor specialists, that oxygen is the en enemy. Um, oxygen compounds are very quick, or oxygen is very quick to form compounds with anything. It'll start grabbing flavors and changing them very quickly. We call that oxidation. Uh, so there's certain red wines that they want to bring out some of those like kind of sherry, um, more of those oxidative notes, sherry, brown sugar, a little bit of darker flavors. So that's why they might aerate it. But if you wanted to bring those out in a Pinot Grigio, start a little of that rapid oxidation by aerating it, you could definitely do that. Also, another great thing is when we're swirling wine, you are aerating it. So it's kind of fun to try wine a few times and then like I was saying, really give it a pretty good swirl and start to get some of that aeration going um, and try if you like it that way as well. Everything, everything that you aerate, the flavors will change. It really depends what you're looking for. And your friend might like some of that sherry quality in their wine. That's good. Um, Kathy asked, um, lots of information to appreciate at a wine tasting, but what if you're at a social dinner with wine? What is a less involved way to taste the wine and decide if it's acceptable to accompany the dinner? Oh, great question. So yeah, I think, um, like I said, those three short sniffs, that three one second sniffs are really the best way to start getting um, aroma into your uh, nasal cavity as the best you can, according to science. And then, like I said, you don't always have to pinch your nose to kind of force that retro nasal action. So if I was just testing a wine, I would do the three sniffs, I would take a sip and then try to push that exhale out my nose as I swallow. Just, you don't have to pinch it in front of your psalm if you don't want to, but um, getting that retro nasal aroma, you're still getting your taste going. Um, I think that's the quickest method where you can make sure you like everything, it's tasting good to you. Um, but you could probably do the whole thing pretty quickly. I've, I've rushed through it in 60 seconds, so. <laughs> That's good to know. So I don't have to fake it anymore. I'm just like, mm, he's good. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Someone asked, what signifies dry or crisp? Good question. So yeah, dry, dryness is usually um, what we use we talk about as an indicator of how sweet something is. So if it's really sweet, you know, it's got that weightiness on your palate, you're kind of feeling almost cloying. Some of those wines that are like a demi-sec, something really sweet, that's a sweet wine. And then dry wine is the opposite. So really what we're saying in technicality is that it ferments down where there's no sugar left. Something like Brut Nature you might see on the label means there's literally, it ferments down all the way to zero. So it's dry in the sense of no sugar, um, but then, crispness and dryness like I was talking about with tannins that drying sensation that happens with tannins is when they say it has a dry finish it has a dry mouth feel and crisp usually tends to be a combination of dryness and acidity so kind of like when you bite into like a green apple and you get that kind of snappiness that crispness that's really what we're saying so something that will say oh it's crisp it's refreshing usually has a little bit of acidity there with that dryness as far as low sugar and a little tannin um, this question goes with um, acidity. Alexis wants to know what char characteristics we should look for if we need something with lower acidity. Um, is there a hint on the label? That's a good question. I think definitely talk to uh, your whoever's at your wine shop because there are certain, especially regions like Italian reds tend to be high acidity. That's just something you can know, but wine um, makers vary from maker to maker, how they make everything. Um, so if you really are wanting to make sure you don't like acidity and you're looking for a couple good wineries or good regions, I would talk um, specifically, yeah, to who's at the wine shop. Cause every now and then you'll pick up something and you think it will taste one way and it'll be completely different. So to be sure people who are stocking the wines usually know exactly what they taste like. Um, Ellen asked, what about clearing the palate between sampling? 
Great question. I, yeah, I didn't know if we should get into that. So the best um, palate cleanser is actually the scent of yourself, which is interesting. So like I said, we are using our senses naturally. They came to us as difference detectors. And the one sense that you are always around, you can never get away from is the scent of you. So when we're judging things like wine competitions or just using a, a quality assurance panel at a winery or distillery, what we'll do just to cleanse our senses is just kind of smell the crook of your elbow or some people will just smell their hands. I think the elbow is a little better, but um, that's a way to reset your senses. And then as far as what we like to use as an actual palate cleanser, usually just barely chilled uh, sparkling water. So the bubbles are gonna kind of, you feel like a mechanical method for cleaning off that palate, uh, kind of scrubbing it clean and it not being too cold is not gonna shock your senses or cool your palate too much. So that's usually the, um, the, the two things you'll do. It's really funny if you're ever in a judging room, everyone's like smelling themselves or like I used to have a, a scarf I would like dive, dive my nose into in between samples. So uh, that's the, the best palate cleanser is always with you because it's just you. <laughs> that is so funny. If you were in that room and you had no idea what was going on. Oh yeah, people do the craziest stuff when we're judging too. So <laughs> they'll like close their eyes and yeah. <laughs> um. Richard asked an interesting question. He said, does age change tasting profile of wine significantly? I know there's like wines that people stereotypically correlate to different generations of people in age. Um, do you mean, so the age of the person or the age of the wine? Or we could do oh, both. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know which way they were. Um, yeah, I guess. we can <laughs> we can do both. Yeah, so it's kind of a misnomer that our senses deaden as we get old. It's something that uh, we definitely, we think is going on, but you can work them out like a muscle. If you were doing this tasting method every day, your muscles, your tasting muscles would stay quite strong. We actually see after six weeks of training, um, the, the olfactory bulb in the brain physically grows. You can see it on MRIs, which is really cool. So no matter what age, you can keep your taste strong and really enjoy them. But then as far as the ages of the wine, uh, a lot of what's happening in age, as wine is aging is certain flavors are mellowing and other ones are coming forward. Um, so instead of maybe having so so much bold tannin and things like that, those really bold notes are kind of kind of come down and be a little more subtle and other notes might rise forward when those ones are coming down. Um, and also like I was mentioning about some of those oxidative qualities, there is gonna be a little oxi oxygen in every bottle of wine. You know, you see that headspace at the top of the wine. So that oxygen can slowly go to work Kind of making some of more of those darker flavors like i was saying maybe like those um more toasty darker maillard flavors a little bit of like the more caramely notes and things like that really if you think about something like a port or a sherry that has those brown sugars those are super oxidated um those are some things that'll start forming and things like red wine so every wine will age a little differently and there's definitely ones that age better but uh yeah yeah you're definitely right i think he was referring to the wine but either way <laughs> Just when you followed it up, I was like, actually, that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> wine. Yeah. No matter what age, you can hold on to your senses and taste the same wines and love them. Um, let's see. Oh, Anonymous asked, going back to um, how if like the wine has gone bad, how long can you keep an open bottle? That's a good question. So it will definitely... Um, vary from wine to wine. Some of the more delicate wines, so like rosés that we tasted today that have those more delicate flavor profiles, not as intense, bold flavors, um, they'll start to lose their flavor quite quickly. So a couple weeks, like I would say, ideally you're keeping everything open for no more than a week, but for a rosé especially, like no more than two weeks. Some of your reds can last a little bit longer. Um, and the really important thing, which I did not do on my sparkling, but you can see on my uh, French right back here, if you just get that cork on as fast as you can, that's going to help preserve a lot of the flavors and not let so much oxygen and whatever else is floating around um, into that bottle and then getting it back in the fridge as well will help preserve that flavor. But it's going to definitely depend from wine to wine. Something with more tannins and antioxidants can last a little bit longer. The more delicate flavors, you're going to see those disappear quickly. Good to know. Um, we have time for one more question. So we're going to take the one from Florence. They asked, are, are organic wines in general better in taste for our health, um, for the environment, or is it just a money trap? Good. That's an interesting question. So 
Definitely. Um, as far as for the environment, it's always great to try to keep our natural, you know, resources living the way they would naturally, not having pesticides, not introducing things into our environment that are um, killing off pests or bugs or anything that, you know, pesticides run off into our water system. And that's not great. So that's definitely a great movement that's happening. People are learning a lot about how to grow grapes organically, keeping them healthy and super flavorful. Um, as far as your health and natural wine, things like leaving out sulfites, there are definitely people that have allergies to sulf um, sulfur compounds and sulfites. But for the most part, there's so little in the wine that it's not going to affect most of us. Uh, that's a little bit of a mis misnomer. Um, and then there's the fact that there's certain wines that just really the kind of grapes can't grow organically or aren't done um, are harder to do organically. So it also depends on which wines you're looking for. Some it's just not an option. And then I think when she was talking about organic, there's also the kind of new natural wine movement, which is a little less defined. I don't like to say anything's a money trap because I hope everyone has great intentions behind them. But Organic is something that they usually need to have certified and it's they have to go through a process. They have to prove they're doing everything very naturally, whereas natural wine is not really regulated. So anyone who feels that they're doing something more naturally than they were before can really use that term. Um, those natural wines also tend to have a little bit more of those funky, almost sour flavor profiles than um, organic wines that tend to be made still in the style of the original wine, just with organic grapes. So those are two terms. Natural is definitely easier if they want to market to a certain um, cohort of people to just slap that on the label and see what happens. Whereas organic, they are trying to work and use our natural resources and grow grapes naturally, which I think is definitely commendable. Yeah. Well, that was a good one to end on. Um, yeah. We have a lot of great questions. Thank you for taking the time to answer all of those. Um, we're just going to go through a few last slides before we close it out. Um, I wanted to make sure we shared your book. Um, I'm putting the links to the book and your social media and then the slides today in the chat. Um, Mandy, I don't, if you want to chime in with any more information on the book, you can. Yeah, definitely. It's um, it go, Chapter four goes through that tasting method, but it covers everything from how we taste differently as people to tasting for travel, tasting in memory, all, all the aspects of taste. It's really about getting to know your own senses and becoming a better taster. And all that info is on howtotastebook.com. And if anyone has questions, like you said, you threw in that, um, that link to my social. I see we have like 70 more questions that we didn't get to. So I'm always happy to answer questions on social media when I can too. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, we have one last slide. Just to share that we're on TikTok. Um, we post some really fun content on there. So don't miss out on that. You can follow us at Meetup. Um, yeah, be, be sure to check us out. Uh, we, as a reminder, we will also have a recap and recording of this event that will be published on our blog at meetup.com slash blog. Um, and that will be up next week. So be sure to be on the lookout for that if you want to watch the recording. And thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed myself. Um, thank you, Mandy, for taking your time and have a great rest of your day. Bye, guys. Thanks for having me. Bye.